I'm going to check again before I release this, but um, uh, I think we're okay on sound. The issue in the last um, Immigrant's Guide to Sci-Fi World episode was these, this magnetic field structure that I had sitting, uh, actually attached, hanging underneath this uh, support bar for a shelf that's over the top of this webcam you can't see. And it was composed of these guys, big neodymium magnets of some power. And I had taken that power and increased it by virtue of the, uh, ah, shit, sorry. By virtue of the folding that I had done with the magnetic fields from some, this is my coffee stained version, obviously, um, from some stuff that I had learned in part three of this book. I, I have, the book is so important to me, I have a copy out here, I have another copy over there, I have a copy in the, um, <laughs> in the house, I have another copy upstairs in the house, I have PDF copies on all of my uh, digital equipment, let's put it down here, less likely to be coffee stained. There we go. Uh, anyway, so, uh, Immigrant's Guide to Sci-Fi World, uh, Season Zero, uh, Episode One, and we're going to talk about some of the stuff that was in the data sets and where we're at now and some of the um, future foreshadowing that might be presciently enabled within those data sets. So we had a uh, series of data sets that were talking about the emergence of what I labeled sci-fi world. And sci-fi world had some distinguishing characteristics. And the distinguishing characteristics included um, a generalized global sense of chaos. Uh, what was termed the sun disease. Which we can equate with um, uh, this. And um, the emergence of uh, secrets revealed. which uh, can be broken down into uh, little subsets that included uh, real human history and uh, the release of uh, UFO info and technology. And so that, that was part of our uh, descriptive sets for what was termed sci-fi world, what I, what I coined the term of sci-fi world. And, and we might note that we're in that period of chaos. Uh, we have had emergence of sun disease and many of the other uh, aspects of the um, uh, smaller subsets of the data have appeared. And we've um, seen, uh, but we have yet to see the real release of UFO tech info and technology, but we've seen the little thin wedge, right? The thin edge of the wedge. We've seen the camel's snout underneath the edge of the tent as UFO camel tries to come on in. And um, so we, we can feel that it may be uh, imminent happening, uh, about to manifest, and so on. But, but it's not actually here at the moment. I mean, we're not actually using any of that new information. We're not building on this and, and uh, all of this kind of burgeoning that was part of sci-fi world. Because other aspects of sci-fi world that were, were primary descriptor sets um, of the aspects and attributes included the idea of combinoric growth. Um, and this was combinoric growth, and, and it was 
economic and it was engineering of all kinds. Um, it was emerging, uh, enabling, empowering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Commonwealth growth uh, emerges from uh, the release of the information and the freeing of our minds as humans, and the um, shift from. Uh, from a situation where uh, economic capital, so a shift from economic capital much more of a shift, okay, from economic capital equaling money to economic capital equaling uh, understanding because the Barrier to entry, okay. The barrier to entry to new economic success drops as we have the release of the uh, UFO info and technology because of the nature of the technology and because of the nature of what humans, this is all forecast, all right? So all of this stuff here is the forecast, these are all forecast parameters of sci-fi world. And uh, in any event, so the, the um, barriers to economic success fall um, as information rises within the generalized population because we start piggybacking and doing things with it, right? It's like, uh, very much like uh, the emergence of hip hop, where sampling of previous works elevates works of the present, or sets the base upon which they're built. Very much like software these days. Software these days is now uh, more of a component industry as opposed to having to write all the routines to get things to occur. You go and select components from pre-written libraries that are tested, secure, et cetera, et cetera. And you glue them together with the language of your choice for the application that you intend to provide. And then you, then you spend a lot of your time trying to debug them and make them efficient within the, um, the metaphor that you're attempting to achieve uh, with your software. And, and, uh, but the elevation has, has happened because you're using components. Many of the components you may use over and over again and never have to mess with, right? And so it's like um, uh, the components in this 3D software, Blender. And I need to do some stuff relative to my magnet work to be able to describe the complexity of these folded magnetic fields I'm now able to achieve from having uh, read into Boscovich uh, sufficient depth to get some of the ideas. Um, and I have to alter Blender, but I don't have to rewrite the whole program. I only have to add a, and put an add-on in there, a modifier, that will allow me to express realistic magnetic fields in order to be able to demonstrate, that is to say, print out for the application for patent process that I know what the hell I'm doing. So in any event, but so that's relatively small, writing a, a little bit of C code and recompiling Blender, and then I'll have a proprietary version of Blender that will be able to do accurate magnetic field strength modeling based on um, uh, designed magnetic field distortions, if you will, or disturbances is another way to think of it. But that's a, another further episode in, in this. Anyway, so as these barriers to entry to economic success fall, we start alleviating some of the chaos, okay? Some of the energy that's going into the chaos starts being redirected into successful uh, new enterprises as we go forward. and. And those new successful enterprises themselves begat all different kinds of enterprises, just the way that the initial uh, large-scale computers ultimately come down to cell phones, right? And uh, in, along the way, they create all kinds of industries that, that come into existence and fade away, and new ones emerge and fade away. And this is the economic growth that has stalled since 1971. Uh, there's a really good, I'm going to swap screens here. So there's a really 2020 good, uh, has been a year um, 
with Eric Weinstein, uh, which is, uh, how do I do that? There we go, okay. Uh, it's The Verdict with Ted Cruz, episode 39, in which Eric goes into what's causing the chaos of the moment is essentially the stalling of personal income growth and the rise of barriers to entry to economic participation, not even success, just participation, that began in 1971. And since then, we, we, and this was, of course, the initiation of the petrodollar. As, as Nixon cut the, the convertibility of the dollar to gold standard, we went on to the petrodollar. And most currencies, most people don't, are unaware of this, but all, all currencies of one form or another have, in the history of, of humanity, it lists, uh, uh, had lifespans that extend from about 50 years to somewhere around 72 years. So somewhere in that time, the 50 years to 72 year mark uh, is when currencies die. It's when they go and crap out on us. And curiously, we're right there for the petrodollar. The petrodollar is being rejected. The US dollar is being rejected as the global world uh, reserve currency. And so we have the chaos that always attends such times. They go into this, Eric Weinstein and... Um, let me see of surprises. There it is. Can't tell our listeners and, what... Um, Ted Cruz and this other fellow, I'm sorry, I don't know who his name is, who he is, Michael Knowles. Um, and they go into this. And one of the things that Eric keys in on, that's really um, a very excellent uh, thing to watch, and certainly you should uh, involve yourself for an hour and four minutes, uh, but Eric gets into the idea that it was this period in 1971 in which the uh, participation, uh, the ability to participate in our economic system started diverting that l led to the current chaos of the day. And that he's probably exactly accurate with that. And our forecast, um, uh, and let me stop for a bit of personal history, I really came into the economic world as an adult 100% uh, on my own resources in that period of time, 1970s and onward. I had, I had had jobs in the past um, as a teenager, uh, but I didn't depend on those for my survival. Uh, from that point on, from 1971, that was the case. And we get into a situation in 72 when basically the economy crashed all over because of the conversion, because of the creation of the petrodollar and the conversion and the, and the chaos that it caused in the economic markets. And then all the social chaos that afflicted my generation, all the unemployment lines, all of this kind of stuff was, was as a result of um, that conversion, ultimately, if we keep looking back and back and back. Uh, now we have the situation where we're converting, and we're converting from, from uh, existing economic systems into something new. The currency of this something new is very likely to be cryptocurrencies, thus we see the hyperinflationary push of the cryptocurrencies uh, moving it up, just as we saw the hyperinflationary push of the petrodollar creation push of gold and silver. You always have to have this kind of an alternative thing going on. And so, so we have this um, understanding, and we can look to uh, Eric's um, appearance in the show and uh, the discussion that they had and grasp the idea that, that much of the chaos that exists now and, and the origination of Antifa and, and the breakdown of the social order and the social contract, uh, that a lot of that is entirely due to uh, um, this breakdown in 1971 that began this process of creating a currency that is now dying. Now, he doesn't get into the depth of the petrodollar and so on. He's just talking about the idea that growth is the underlying um, limiter that's, that is that everybody's run into that's caused the chaos because there was a huge level of barriers of entry that kept getting greater and greater and greater. And by barrier of entry, let's just examine it really easily. You have a lot of people that have gone to college and, and have spent have gone into debt for huge amounts of money with the idea that that college, with maybe most of them not, but nonetheless socially than the contract, the idea is that the, the college experience for which they're going to go into debt for the rest of their lives should have A, prepared them for um, life as an adult, 
and B, should have provided them with some kind of value to society that could be compensated for uh, in an economic fashion uh, that would see them through the rest of their lives. And that's not true. So they've got $100,000 in debt for a, for a degree that in no way enables them to make a living off of anything they learned in that degree. And so that's a huge barrier to entry, to participation. Not only just not only success, but just participation. If you've got $100,000 in debt hanging over you before you even begin, even if you know you're going to go into something that might be successful, like you know, doctoring or engineering or something like this, right? Uh, uh, or plumbing even, right? Who knows? Um, but even if you knew you were going to go into something successful, having $100,000 in debt when you start your career is not the way to begin. And so our, our society is skewed. It must break. We must have this period of chaos. We've got to re-engineer and restructure our social order to provide um, participation and, and uh, remove barriers to entry um, to new economic success. All right, we don't, we don't want old economic success. We don't want to reinvent the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, any of that kind of shit. We don't need corporatism. We don't need any of this. We need to emerge in this new distributed, decentralized, um, burgeoning, growing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's the thing. The sci-fi world, and the reason we're having these discussions, and we'll continue to have them as long as people um, irritate me enough to do them, and my audio doesn't screw up. Um, uh, these Immigrants Guide to Sci-Fi World, much of that was very exciting to me when I got into those data sets because it was all about this idea of common or growth, where, you know, uh, dumbass kid in basement A gets an idea and he presents it on the internet, he develops it enough that a little bit of attention gets to it, and dumbass kids B, C, and D scattered all around the world see it and make up something else uh, relative to it, expand on that idea, reconnect some other dots, and create something entirely new, no longer dependent on his idea, and then their stuff is, is commonorically set upon, and we build this lattice work of creative thinking and, and build off of all of this. Now, okay, so that's a setup. You know, we went 17 minutes. It's a little long. I'd hope to do it in seven, but nonetheless, there we are. That's sci-fi world. These are some of the major uh, linguistic underpinnings of sci-fi world that emerged within the data sets that were captured from 1997, which is when sun disease first showed up, all the way through to 2018, okay, uh, through and including 2018. These are some of the major memes that we had going there. And we note that the Kaminoric growth uh, was economically empowering uh, and it created all new kinds of engineering, and there was all this interesting stuff within the data uh, that, that enabled the social order to have an outlet for the energy that's currently being expressed in chaos. But curiously, within those data sets, there was an aspect of this chaos that was essential, it seemed. I, you know, my interpretation could be wrong, but there was a clear connection let me state that my interpretation on many of these things has been slightly skewed just based on, on this. And I'll bring up an example right now. This element I'm at, uh, talking about was the idea of these riots. All right? So, so our data sets, uh, going back into 2014 through, two, maybe even earlier, maybe it was 2012. I, I'd have to remember, okay? I'd have to go back and look. Through 2016, or 17, had the idea of these global riots, uh, such that specific instances came out in the data. Those specific instances in, uh, include, included Rome and Maryland. In the case of Rome, it was the Vatican as the site. In the case of Maryland, it was the NSA. Or I'm assuming the NSA. Let's just say that could be badly labeled. It, but government, a deep government bum bunker. In both cases, within the subsets of these things about riots, which we had, I had originally put in there as being food related. Okay, because I kept getting a lot of language about famine, which we now sh see is actually emerging 
That language is emerging now as people worry about a giant famine sweeping around the world due to COVID and the collapse of the Three Gorges Dam, which has yet to happen at the time that I make this video, but may well happen within the next uh, 85 days or so. Um, so, but this, this famine was a predominant uh, thing that seemed to be related to the riots, to, was at least temporally related. So these are all TRs, they're all temporally related. And the famine language and the food riots were such that that's what, how I discussed them within the uh, reports, and within the, within the data sets in which we described, or I described sci-fi world. Okay, and so in those, in those data sets, we had Rome having food riots to the point where people pushed down this wall. It seemed accidental, as though somehow police fighting with people in the street push up an old brick against an old brick wall. It collapses, and it turns out to be a way of get people getting into some Vatican area that apparently was unknown to be able to be gotten into, a secret way back into the Vatican. And from there, people pour into the the guts of the Vatican and the Vatican Library, we'll put that in quotes, is, is exposed. And so we get our, our secrets revealed, starting off. Uh, at the same time, or near the same time, or even ahead of that, we had food riots showing up in what, and I'd labeled them as food riots because of the predominance of the language here, but it may be that the motivation, the, the to be reported in the media motivation for the riots might well be racism or who knows what the hell, right? Or, or social disorder this coming fall as a result of Trump winning by a landslide or who the hell knows what. But in any event, I had it happening in Maryland in a, in a multiple tiered, so we're talking about something with like five layers uh, underground uh, building uh, with all kinds of files and shit in it and stuff um, uh, gets, gets uh, broken into as this uh, fence comes down and the people uh, get in there and its stuff comes out. It becomes uh, exposed, okay, as part of the secrets revealed again. And so here we have these, these twin areas that, that participate via riots in, which are certainly chaotic, but they actually participate in the data sets in, in relating to the um, aspect of, of all of these events unfolding that would calm the chaos and, and lead to a social order change that causes all of this stuff to disappear over a number of years as we go in towards Ice Age. So I sort of thought of it as a, as a good time. I wasn't really fond of the idea of food riots and, and famine and so on. And we're going to have famine. That keeps showing up in the language even now. And we have the riots now. But I don't know that the riots are ever going to evolve into the point where they're food riots in a general sense, OK? Uh, and it may be that our, our famine and all of this kind of stuff relates more to the sun disease. And it evolves at a slower pace. And it's never really a motivating factor in any of the riots that we, we see that uh, will ultimately participate in, uh, at least temporally, in the emergence of sci-fi world. And so here's where we could be wrong with this, all right? Because I could be wrong in that the, the riots are anything other than temporally connected. So we may indeed have riots that cause problems for the Vatican. We may indeed have riots that cause problems in Maryland. Uh, and may cause problems for government installations in Maryland and in, are in no way going to actually involve themselves with the secrets revealed and so on. And yet we, could, we ha may have the secrets, we will have the secrets revealed, it's already underway, still rolling on. And it was just at the time that they showed up in the data sets, they were temporally linked and, and my mind and the interpretation gives them an actual link that it would be causal or near causal. And it was nothing more than a temporal uh, relation in the, in the language that was being presented. That aside, we still have a situation where we do have these things emerging. We do have riots, we do have an unfolding language about uh, famine, we do have the unfolding language uh, ahead of the collapse of the dam, uh, we do have the um, uh, social unrest, the social chaos, uh, globally, but concentrated very significantly within the United States. We have the war with China ongoing. All of these things that were 
um, discussed in the data sets going back years and years, decades actually, that were part of the larger growth in the data sets, the larger uh, congealing, if you will, around the idea of emergence in 2020, we now know it to be 2020, of sci-fi world that uh, is the offering or, or is its own um, solution, right? So as, as the Taoists say, as the yogis say, you know, within every problem is the exact description of the solution required. Uh, universe presents you the solution in the form of a problem. And so the universe has presented us a solution in the form of the problem of sun disease and the uh, social uh, degradation, uh, the destruction of the economic system due to the uh, collapse of the petrodollar and the, uh, or because due to the existence of the petrodollar and the collapse of the opportunity wave that had led uh, the mass of the USA and was beginning to lead the mass of the developed world from the 1947 period up through 1971 when it ran into a hard wall. All of these things have presented to us solutions to themselves. And the solutions turn out to be uh, the um, described within our, or, or within my data sets, uh, was this period of time of secrets revealed where, it, where enough was enough. The lying was enough, we could all see it was lying and we just knew that you were lying and we just would all turn our backs on you because we knew you were lying and enough is enough and the government is just continually lying and they're constantly sitting there just blinking and blinking at you every single time they're saying any damn thing at all and you know that they're lying and we just all had it and and so secrets start coming out during that period because people stand up and they say fuck it here's what's actually going on and it may not be good but here it is people deal with it and so we have to grow up and be adults. And that's part of going into sci-fi world as well, is the emergence of the, what is it, the end of childhood. Or childhood's end. Um, and it's part of my sci-fi theme, right? Childhood's end. Um, and so uh, the nature of the description of sci-fi world included the idea that within the problem, or within the, the solution being described as these series of problems was a single element that could connect them all and provide an elegant solution to emerge for all of the problems simultaneously. So it's a different kind of a thing where instead of the solution to the um, uh, problems with the river being presented to you in the river, you, you understand that the solutions to the problems that are being presented in the river as well as those being presented on the beach as well as those being presented in the atmosphere lie with something you can do in a planting on the nearby mountains, okay? And so it's, a, it's an, an elevation of elegance of concept of design and design patterns. And we're gonna come to see this more and more as we go forward and we get into this Kaminoric growth period. And all of it will relate to the idea of the release of this UFO technology. And we're seeing that now with the, just the bare hint that there exists some UFO technology. And once we get to the point where we're actually in that release, now here's, here's where the data sets were very interesting even back when. As I said yesterday, or two days ago with the poor sound, one of the driving forces for the release of the information was always described as desperation. And I had seen the desperation at the time it presented itself within the data sets as being seemingly connected to the desperation inherent in the economics and um, officialdom. And so, but I thought it was for them to try and maintain their power and not go down in flames as they were eaten, consumed uh, by the outraged mobs. Maybe that'll still play out. Maybe that'll still turn out to be an accurate interpretation of the desperation that we'll see that will, re will be leading to the release of the UFO information and technology. But um, it was clear within the data sets that this was the way out, okay? Common or at growth, the explosion, the exponential explosion of technical growth uh, that would occur as a result of the release of the UFO information. 
which would be temporally uh, linked with the rediscovery of real human history. And that we're going to fight about for a long time, okay, because it really brings up all different kinds of stuff that none of us really want to deal with, but we really need to as animals, as, as humans, as, you know, thinking minds. And we've got to get into all of this shit. We've got to get in there and deal with it. But um, the data sets that described sun disease since 1997 described secrets revealed since 2001. 2000, actually, because that was when the data started being gathered. And so we now know that sun disease, a.k.a. CV-19, existent, is existent. It, it manifested. So there, and we also know that we've had hints. The first UFO camel has stuck his uh, snout under the tent, and we're starting to see some of these secrets revealed. We're now living in a world of chaos. There's no reason to suppose that the rest of this will be um, any less accurate. In fact, as each of these things falls into place, it, it tends to build a level of confidence in the other aspects of the sci-fi world part emerging. So in that sense, I'm, um, uh, I'm optimistic, I'm buoyantly optimistic, but I recognize that we have to go through a period of time that we'll, we'll have some people dealing with this particular mindset. And so it's, a, um, it's an interesting time for me. Now, hopefully this is, uh, this uh, episode one here uh, has uh, rectified the sound, and I'll check that in a few minutes. I've moved all of those folded magnetic fields with their um, magnetic field interplay uh, away from this particular area, which is all, uh, I mean, the problem is my, my little space is so damn narrow. It used to house an RV, okay? And RVs are not very wide. They're intended to go down the road, be eight feet. So, so this bugger is 12 feet wide, basically. And then we have all kinds of stuff in it, so I'm kind of squeezed in here. And so the magnetic fields have a tendency to, to really get to be an issue. And I'd had it over here. Every time I turned, I saw that it would, it would fluctuate I mean, I didn't understand what was going on because I didn't, you can't see the magnetic fleet, the fields, but later on when examining the video and everybody was bitching about the sound, I went back and saw what my actions were that were causing the sound to, to deviate, uh, even with the lapel mic, and it's like, oh, damn, okay, and so I went and did some tests, and sure enough, the field was strong enough at 39 inches, that's how far it was away from here, at 39 inches, it was strong enough to, um, pretty much shut that sound right down, cut it in half at least. Uh, interesting, interesting the things you can do with um, uh, these disturbed or magnified uh, magnetic fields, which I'll get into at some further point because I'm still plowing through part three of um, Theoria. Anyway, so uh, there's a whole lot more of stuff in um, emerging, as we merge into sci-fi world, it's, you know, way too much to cover at any given time. I don't like taking a whole lot of time in the summer here. I've got to get ready for this winter um, and all of the problems that are going to be uh, in existence for the next couple of years as we uh, merge into sci-fi world. The sci-fi world period, if we want to think of it that way, uh, is probably uh, seriously going to be, say, four years. So we're at year zero. And we'll go out to 2024. And at the end of 2024, from that point on, we'll be able to say that it's been manifest. So it won't be a point of uh, transition anymore. And so we're at the very beginning of the transition. So everything is hugely chaos. As we get towards the end of the transition, it'll be less so. It, chaos will continue for a number of years, especially economic, especially uh, technical, because so much will be happening especially also with climate, because we'll be merging into the um, Ice Age in a very serious way. But these data sets do appear to be much more accurate than I would have given credence to, um, given that the timing was wrong, that the whole thing was shifted out about two plus years, maybe two years in a month. Uh, and now we're going to see those uh, timing things reconcile, and here we go. So anyway. Um, <laughs> That's the end of this. Uh, again, if you need to get sleep during this period of time, I release this because it does work. 
And the ingredients in here, uh, some of them, because this is a fusion, it's a fusion of um, ancient Ayurvedic uh, understanding and uh, modern supplement knowledge, amino acids, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, some of the ingredients have been used for over a thousand years for producing uh, good sleep, lucid dreaming, etc. cetera. Uh, and you can use them for a long time. Uh, I'm at probably two plus years now in use of it in terms of having developed it, it took eight months to get up to the point where I was satisfied with the formula and then I was pretty consistent with the, the formulaic mix and then over the course of the last year we brought it out as a, a product myself and the, and the nice people at uh, Pure Bulk and we have a lot of um, users of it now who are repeat customers because it, it does work. Uh, so anyway, check it out, Pure Bulk, uh, Pure Sleep at Pure Bulk. I'll put a um, uh, link in the description below. Uh, also now for the sun disease, uh, the Israelis have uh, had a study with 7,800 people. And I, I should have put that up on my uh, little other screen there. Here, let me get rid of this real quick. This is, this is good information. Okay, so uh, personally, I don't, I don't understand it really, how this, such a situation could occur. But in Israel, they had seven 7,807, I think it was, people that uh, they got tested for the sun disease. Of those that were positive, or of those that were negative, let's look at the, the bad part of it first. Of those that had a, had a, excuse me, okay. Of those that were positive for the, for the CV and had a negative outcome, that is to say they had the disease, um, they had, uh, vitamin D insufficiency to the level of, of 20 nanograms per milliliter or lower. They were less than 20 nanograms per milliliter or, or lower. Okay, those that had no response, did not have the disease, were 21 nanograms per milliliter or higher which is confirmatory with what I've had up here for a long time. And so uh, it now appears that we're getting yet more statistical science that vitamin D is a key against um, D3 plus K2 um, is what you need to take. Um, uh, the vitamin D is, is proof against the sun disease as a preventative. It's cheap, it's effective, it makes you healthy, it participates in over 3,000 uh, epigenetic um, processes in the body and should be considered to be just part of your daily regimen from now on because sun disease is here and we're going to live with it for the rest of my life certainly, but probably for the rest of everybody's life who's alive at this moment. So um, just, just the way it is. Anyway, so with respect, uh, we'll, we'll do more of these things. Uh, not that until everybody says, hey, no more, oh, stop it, stop it, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> okay.